Hi, this is Eddie Fitzgerald with uh, John Chris Valusi. <laughs> Hi. And we'll be commenting on Claws for Alarm by Chuck Jones. Chuck had done this cartoon before a few years earlier with Scaredy Cat. And uh, boy, Chuck is such an experimenter. I think he just wanted to see the same cartoon over again, but just done in a different way, which it certainly is. It's an excellent cartoon. The previous cartoon began with Porky and Sylvester already in the house and just saying, well, here we are in this wonderful hotel. <laughs> so you're establishing the characters and showing the hotel at the same time. Whereas here they use the traditional Hollywood method of, you know, establishing one thing at a time. First you establish who the characters are and what the relationship is. And then you establish the locale and the situation they're going to get into. It's just a variation Personally, I prefer the first way because the audience, the, you know, that was done in the earlier cartoon because people already know these characters, so you don't have to spend a lot of time introducing them. But this works, too. It's an interesting experiment. I love the way people go to bed so early in these country towns. This is Maurice Noble's backgrounds. I think Maurice did so much on this cartoon. The, uh, the design is so much a part of it that uh, he almost deserves a co-direction credit. The animation on this is a lot more limited than uh, Scaredy Cat, too. Yeah. It's, it's, the Scaredy Cat animation is amazing. It's just really beautiful. And the characters are a lot more rounded, more like the Clampett cartoons, the, the mid-40s style. And this is getting into the more angular. And it's a lot of limited animation where the characters are just held and they turn their heads or whatever like that. See, so yeah. his head's moving and nothing else is. Chuck in, Chuck in his later cartoons, he, he kind of invented limited animation. Uh, I don't know why, because... You know, he, he didn't like limited animation when he saw it on television, yet he's one of the fathers of it. And this cartoon really showed it, especially when you compare it to Scaredy Cat, which is fully animated and round and beautiful and really lively poses and expressions. This is a lot more talky too, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Lots and lots of talky. Chuck Jones's later cartoons became talky. If I remember right, Bill Blank liked these later cartoons probably because they really featured the voice artist rather than the, uh, the, you know, the animation artist. Yeah, that's probably true. Maurice was a great guy in real life. I worked with him on one project, and uh, a really salty guy, uh, had a lot of opinions about things, and he didn't suffer fools well. Extremely nice guy in spite of that. Uh, very intense, very into what he was doing. He took everything he did really seriously, and he expected you, if, uh, if you had any disagreement, to be able to articulate everything that you disagreed about. I wonder how he, how he and Chuck got along. I'll bet there was a little bit of friction there. Because you have two strong minds <laughs> with maybe differences of opinion, but evidently it worked out. This is another cartoon I just still framed and watched endlessly. The thing about this cartoon is that it's so directed. I mean, the the style, the the voices, the uh, the animation, everything about it is one going in one direction. It's one of the most thoroughly directed films I've ever seen. Although, you know, when you compare it with Scaredy Cat, you could ask yourself the question of which is the best kind of direction, the kind of direction that calls attention to itself, as you see here, or the kind of direction which is kind of invisible because it just moves the story along so well that you're just all wrapped up in the story and you're not even thinking of what the director's doing. Uh, well, the story works just as well or even better in Scaredy Cat. I loved both these cartoons when I was a kid just because the whole situation is really funny. Yeah. You know, Sylvester sees the ghosts and Porky doesn't. But I think it works a lot better in Scaredy Cat because the characters seem more alive. They have more personality, and they're animated beautifully. Every scene is fun to look at the animation. And here it's just sort of the animation tells the story, period. Maybe Chuck discovered here that when you have a strong graphic design element in the background, it almost doesn't need as much animation because you're half looking at the background all the time. I get, the feeling, that, I I get the feeling that Chuck thought animators were an irritant. <laughs> That they're in the way of his drawings. You remember Bill Melendez? Bill Melendez on one of the commentaries said that some directors like to hand you all the drawings and they didn't, like the, they didn't want the animators to contribute much. Uh, Clampett was the opposite of that. Clampett let the animators put a lot of themselves into each scene. That's why his cartoons are so much more lively. And in Chuck Jones's 40s cartoons, the animators do put a lot more into the scenes, like that Wakiki Wabbit we just watched. Yeah. In this one... It's basically a pose-to-pose -pose cartoon, and all the poses are drawn by Chuck himself. He, he eventually evolved into letting the animators do less and less work. I think because he didn't want to be upstaged. That may be. 
But, you know, it, it, if so, maybe that wasn't the right way to go because animation is about – the animated cartoons are about animation. It's about caricaturing the way things move and the way people act, not just the way they look. It's too bad Scaredy Cat isn't on this – right next to this cartoon where you could watch the two together. Oh, it would be great. Scaredy Cat is nonstop fun. To me, uh, there's a lot of directorial questions. Since this is a very, very clearly directed cartoon, it brings into question a lot of things about directing. And uh, in general, I'm amazed that anybody can make a directed cartoon because... I, to me, the biggest problem with direction is uh, distractions. I mean, somebody, you or somebody you're working with comes up with a really interesting idea and you think to yourself, holy cow, I've got to use this. I can't even imagine the film without it. This is so funny. And yet it doesn't quite fit into the cartoon and you have to, you know, uh, I don't know, goof up the cartoon in order to, you know, shoehorn it in. And you don't know whether to do that or not. You know, should I sacrifice the whole cartoon for a few great moments or have a cartoon that is good overall but yet doesn't have a classic moment? And this is a horrendous thing. I had a ton of trouble with that myself. I've never had problems with that. <laughs> I don't think Clampett did either. It's, it's not one way or the other. I mean, you can tell a story and, and have everything have to do with that particular story. Well, you know, there was a guy, there's a book I like that I couldn't even get a hold of anymore. Maybe it's out of print, I don't know, called What Made Pistachio Nuts. And the guy had this, this great theory that he said, when you do co- uh, comedic cartoons that are meant to get a laugh, don't do them on a theme. Like, for example, if you do a Chaplin uh, short on the theme of boxing, well, then every good cartoon that the writers think of has to be thrown out if it doesn't fit into boxing. You know, they'll say, oh, that's funny and it made us all laugh, but don't do it because it's, it's not about boxing. So you need a looser story where you can tend to actually use the good ideas that people come up with sitting around the gag table. Bye. 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 <laughs> 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 